I'll tell you one of the reasons uh, that I came to Wesleyan, and that was because I wanted to go to medical school. And Wesleyan had a very good record for getting people like me in medical school. But that begs the question of why did I want to go to medical school? And the reason was is that I was a, a very big fan of Dr. Ben Casey, Dr. Marcus Welby, MD, even Dr. Kildare. Um, there was also a movie with Robert Mitchum, Not as a Stranger. And it all sort of suggested what it would be like to be a doctor. It would be joining this very wonderful, close-knit um, profession, um, be doing something that was very altruistic. And um, I did get to medical school. And within the first few weeks, I felt like I had been disabused. Those shows were not the way it was. There was something very different. What was different, and I could sense this within the first few days, few weeks, month or so, is that um, it wasn't this altruistic organization or profession that I thought. And I also thought that there was a lot of competition to get into medical school, and I thought, well, once you're there, you can relax. No, the first day, uh, our dean said, look around. Three of you will be invited to stay after your medical school. That's not really the way you get along with other people. So what did I do? I decided that someday I'm going to get back. I'm going to write a book about what medicine is really like, not what we want it to be like. The trouble is, of course, um, as a medical student, I didn't have any time. Um, because I actually worked at night. Um, and then you finish medical school, and what happens is you go from the frying pan into the fire. So I was a resident. I still didn't have any time. And then when I finally finished my residency, I was lucky enough to get drafted. <laughs> I know not too many people say that, but it really changed my life. I didn't want to go. <laughs> Uh, I was drafted by the Navy, and I was immediately assigned to the Marines, and I was told I was going to a place called Da Nang. Now, maybe I should have felt a little bit more like, you know, a lot of people are going, I should have wanted to go, but I didn't. But luckily, uh, while I was a medical student, during the summers, when I um, had my elective, I spent my elective um, over at the Cousteau Institute in France. And um, on the Calypso, I happened to meet a very high-ranking naval officer. Now, here I was a medical student. And I sort of helped him a little bit. At the end, when he was leaving, he put his arm around me. He said, son, if you ever find yourself in the Navy, give me a call. So that's what I did. I was in the Navy. I gave him a call. I, see, I asked him if he remembered me, and he did. And so he said, um, listen, I'll get you into my service. And his service was the Sea Lab, which I did. I became a Navy aquanaut and trained with the SEALs, which was sort of fun. But the best thing that happened was that I ended up having to go out on a submarine. Why I say this is important is because I went on this submarine and we went underwater for 75 days. We didn't come to the surface for 75 days. Now, since I've been lucky enough in my writing, I get a lot of doctor friends that will stop me in the hospital and say, you know, I've decided I want to write a bestseller. Can you give me a hint? And I said, yeah, join the Navy and volunteer for submarines because it's the perfect writing environment. You're not troubled by anything. Well, I mean, it changes from daylight is the regular lights, incandescent lights, and night is red lights. 
but otherwise you're not bothered. So it was a perfect environment. So I wrote my first book, as was mentioned, Underwater. And now here's the real interesting thing. I decided to write my first book, fiction. Now, why did I do that? Why didn't I do nonfiction? Because I was interested in changing sort of attitudes about medicine. Why did I write fiction? Well, I was influenced to some degree because there's been a lot of really interesting book, fiction books. I don't know how many of you have read um, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. There's a good example. Now, I know he wrote that book to try to influence how we took care of immigrants, which is sort of interesting. Um, but it actually ended up changing uh, or causing the, the Meat Inspection Act to be passed, the Pure uh, Food and Drug Act to be passed. It really had a huge effect. Another book that had a huge effect um, is Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. That's often given the credit for changing attitudes about slavery. There's also um, Emile Zola's book, Germinal, about social issues and working class people. And there's A.J. Cronin's uh, Citadel. These books all influenced me, and I sort of had an idea, well, why don't I try to do that? I want to try to change some attitudes about medicine and make it the way it really is. One of the issues that I was particularly interested in is the way we train doctors. We train doctors and we put them into this very highly competitive environment and then somehow expect them at the end of this long process to still hold those altruistic attitude that was the reason that they went into medical school. That was one of my issues. The other issue is the fact that I could see that um, medicine was changing um, and it was becoming more interested in business interests uh, than it was in terms of patient interests. So I thought a lot about it and um, I, I've subsequently thought a lot about it. I mean, what is it about fiction that can do this? One, one of the things is that we approach fiction very much different than we approach nonfiction. And one of the reasons is that uh, there is such a thing as poetic justice and happy endings, which you don't have in nonfiction, <laughs> for obvious reasons, uh, because it's fictitious. Um, perhaps the, the most or the strongest reason that fiction is powerful is because it can be emotional. It can draw the reader into a narrative. And when you get drawn into a narrative, then there is this effect, this sort of subliminal effect, that can change or impart sort of voiced uh, or suggested um, uh, beliefs. It's also true that when you, when you read fiction, your guard is down, maybe for those same reasons. When you read nonfiction, it's different. Uh, in nonfiction, you're very critical. And today, it's uh, even interesting is that there's so much material out there that people tend, particularly on the internet, is to gravitate towards blogs and, and information that sort of confirm their beliefs rather than challenge them. Whereas fiction, you can get around that. What else can fiction do? Well, the main thing is it can entertain. It can keep your interest. And, and how do you keep the interest? Well, this is something that I had to learn. Because that first book that I wrote, nobody bought. <laughs> And here I thought that this was a great circumstance. I wrote this first novel about medical training and how we're, we're in a certain sense, not paying attention to personality of the physicians and, and that that's probably very important. But no one, 
very few people bought it. And today it's considered in hardcover a rare book. <laughs> so anybody who is lucky enough to buy one, it's actually worth some money today. I was crushed. I mean, I spent all this effort and this time and, and um, nobody bought it. So what I did and what I was trained here at Wesleyan to do was to go back and, and look at the literature. And what's the literature? The literature is bestsellers. Do you know, I had never read a bestseller up until that point until I suddenly wanted to write one. <laughs> and then I thought, well, the best way to do this now would be to read a few, which I did. I read a whole bunch of bestsellers. And I recognized that, that one of the reasons they're bestsellers is they're darn fun to read. When I went back and reread my first book, I realized that it had a very good issue but it suffered from one minor, one minor sort of problem. And that was that it was boring. <laughs> so I realized that if I had this idea of using fiction to change beliefs and convictions, etc., I had to make it interesting. And I had to make it fun. And there are a lot of books out there I realized that were really fun to, to read. And I had to realize that there's certain tricks as a fiction writer that you do. Like for instance, people understand that um, there are two types of fiction that are very popular. Um, mysteries, Agatha Christie type mysteries. And then there's thrillers. Um, Robert Ludlum, who also went here by the way. I thought, well, they're both interesting. Why not combine them in a mystery thriller? But the trouble is that nobody could tell me what a mystery thriller or a mystery or a thriller was, and I had to learn it on my own. But it is interesting to kind of think about it. Is the difference is, is the way you give information to the reader. In a mystery, you withhold information so that you as the reader are sort of following along with the protagonist and trying to outguess them. So that at the end, when you're drawn into the library and you're told it was the colonel with the wrench, that's a mystery. What's a thriller? Thriller is just the opposite. The thriller is where you as the reader are given some information that the protagonist doesn't have. Who did this really well? There's a movie I remember particularly, Psycho. And the director did this very well. When you were watching that movie and you knew that something terrible was going on in that motel, and then you as the writer, you send the person to the motel. And you say, and you know that what, what's gone on there, and you say, Get out of there. This is a thriller. Especially if the person says, well, I don't see anything here. I think I better leave. And you say, yes, let's leave. And then he sees this Victorian house up on this hill. And there's a little bit of thunder and lightning. He said, well, maybe I should go up there and check that out. <laughs> this is a thriller. And of course, the person goes up there to that house. And you say, don't go in there. Goes in there. Finally, he's ready to leave, and he said, well, nothing here, I think I'll leave, and then I, maybe I should check the basement. <laughs> you know you're not supposed to go in the basement of a Victorian house when there's a thunderstorm. <laughs> so these are some of the reasons or, that I chose fiction. Um, there's also one other, and that is that there's an opportunity to go to another medium. Not only do you have a book, but you can have a movie. And in fact, I realized very early on that someone like myself, who no one knew, that in order to become someone who's known, I really should try to follow 
the footsteps of people who have been successful. That's another thing I learned here at Westman. So I chose two subjects, two projects. One was JAWS. Everybody remember JAWS? Um, the other one, this one probably not too many people remember, Love Story. Anybody remember Love Story? Well, these were two projects that catapulted the writer from being unknown to being known. How did they happen? Well, Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School, we all are taught in the method of projects or you, you, learn, you, you learn by learning actual episodes. So that's what I did. I studied these two projects. And one of the interesting things is I found that both were written as movies first. So my second book, Coma, was written as a movie first. And it worked perfectly. And Coma was much different than my first book that no one bought. And it did have some very interesting things to say. Several of the interesting things, which one was that we certainly have a great need for organs for transplant. And uh, hopefully by showing the other side of this, using this subliminal sense of making people more interested in this issue. But the other interesting issue that I was interested in was, I remember at that point, people would say to me things like, I feel so tired, I should check myself into a hospital. You don't want to do that. That's what coma was to do. So anyway, my idea is to use fiction as a way to change public policy. What I'd like to do is to have a new jungle, have a new Uncle Tom's cabin, a new germinal, etc., to change the fact that we have the most ridiculous healthcare system in the country. We need to change it back to a system in which the patients are first and business is not first. So that's what I'm hoping to do. And I also invite other people to do it too. Thank you.